Okay, uh, so hello everyone. Uh, at the beginning, uh, I just want to say quickly that uh, our meeting will be held in English, uh, but I feel obliged to uh, say several important sentences uh, in Polish uh, because, uh, as I see, uh, most of our audience uh, are Polish. Uh, Tak więc, cześć, dzień dobry, witajcie w imieniu Fundacji Efektywny Altruizm. Jesteśmy polską gałęzią międzynarodowego ruchu Efektywny Altruizm. Nasze dzisiejsze spotkanie jest kolejnym organizowanym przez nas webinarem. W przyszłości gościliśmy m.in. profesora Petera Singera czy Orestesa Kowalskiego. Podczas naszych spotkań staramy się mówić o ważnych, zaniedbanych obszarach działań altruistycznych o efektywnym altruizmie i pokrewnych z nim ideach. U nas w Fundacji ostatnio wiele zmian, zarówno jeżeli chodzi o skład osobowy, jak i o nasze aktywności. Wciąż chcemy popularyzować efektywny altruizm, ale dokładamy teraz do tego również research regionalny, z którym bardzo się ekscytujemy, ma zarodek, zarodek tej aktywności, ma swoje miejsce w programie Charity Entrepreneurship, do którego dołączyliśmy ponad miesiąc temu. Research ten będzie miał na celu wskazanie potencjalnie najbardziej skutecznych idei charytatywnych, jakie możemy zastosować w krajach takich jak Polska, Ukraina, Estonia, Litwa, Mołdawia i Łotwa. I kolejną aktywnością, którą również rozpoczęliśmy, są zbiórki na rzecz najbardziej efektywnych organizacji według GIWL. I stąd nasze dzisiejsze spotkanie, ponieważ w miesiącach wakacyjnych organizowaliśmy zbiórkę na rzecz Malaria Consortium i z końcem sierpnia ta zbiórka się kończy. Także tyle po polsku, dziękuję i przejdę teraz do części już po angielsku do końca spotkania. Uh, okay, so hello everyone uh, again. Uh, on behalf of EA Poland, uh, I want to introduce our today's guest, uh, Christian Rassi from Malaria Consortium. Uh, Christian, uh, Christian is uh, the program director of Malaria Consortium Seasonal Malaria Chemo Prevention, SMC. Uh, Christian is based in London and has led the CMC program since 2019, before joining Malaria Consortium, Christian uh, worked for a range of organizations uh, in the UK, Kenya and Rwanda as a research and strategy consultant. Uh, so, uh, I am giving the floor for Christian. Thank you very much, Maya, and um, good afternoon, everyone. Um, so, as Maya said, my name is Christian. I'm the director of uh, Malaria Consortium Season and Malaria Chemo Prevention Program. And I'm, I'm really grateful that you've given me the opportunity to be here today and to talk about Malaria Consortium's work and specifically to talk about our Seasonal Malaria Chemo Prevention uh, Program, which is uh, one of the Give Well recommended top charities, uh, of course. So, over the next 15, 20 minutes or so, what I'd like to do is just give you a brief overview of what seasonal malaria chemo prevention is and uh, how Malaria Consortium supports the distribution of uh, SMC medicines to millions of children across Africa every year. And then towards the end, I just want to give you a very brief glimpse of what the future of SMC might hold. Now, to do this and to set the scene, I'm afraid I'll have to start with some rather sobering facts. The, the girl you can see in this picture has severe malaria, which means that she will have a very, very high temperature. She will probably be drifting in and out of consciousness, and she will be just generally very, very unwell. And unless she receives appropriate medical care, her chances of survival are really low. Now, unfortunately, that's a picture we still see very commonly in many parts of the world because malaria unfortunately remains a leading cause of illness and of death around the world. According to the World Health Organization, there were around about 230 million cases of malaria in 2019 in 87 countries and more than 400,000 people died from malaria. Now, two things I want to point out about who bears the, the greatest share of the burden of malaria worldwide. About 
two thirds of all the malaria deaths were among children under five. And Africa in general accounts for the vast majority of all malaria cases and deaths, so over 90%. Now, it's not all doom and gloom, right? and it's, it's important to recognize that uh, a lot of progress has been made uh, in the fight against malaria, especially since the turn of the millennium. So let's just look at one indicator that we, we often track to, to give us an idea of uh, how we're progressing, and it's called the uh, global mortality incidence rate. So essentially, that's the annual number of malaria deaths per, one per 100,000 people at risk of malaria. And you can see, if you look at that graph on the right-hand side, you can see that in the year 2000, that was around about 25, and the number has fallen to around about 10 in 2019. And that's really been made possible by the, the wide-scale deployment of effective malaria prevention and control tools. So you'll probably be familiar with bed nets. You may be familiar with indoor residual spraying, prompt access to, uh, to good diagnosis and, and effective treatment of malaria has also played an important role. And the World Health Organization estimates that between the year 2000 and the year 2019, around about 1.5 billion cases of malaria have been averted and around about 7.6 million cases have been uh, lives have been saved since the year 2000. So that's really good news, right? However, it's also true to say that we've seen a bit of a stagnation in the malaria trends over the last five years or so. So if you look at that mortality rate graph again, you'll see that not much has changed since, say, 2015. So the curve has really flattened over the last couple of years. And the same would be true if we looked at many of the other common malaria indicators. So the question, of course, is what, what needs to be done? And the, the answer to that sort of accelerating progress, that we really need a mix of many different responses. Um, so for example, we're hoping for, for innovations such as malaria vaccines to become available at some point in the future. But in the short and in the medium term, one of the most important strategies is to better utilize the tools that we already have. So in other words, we need to optimize those tools and we need to try and close the remaining access gaps. And one of those tools is seasonal malaria chemo prevention. And that's the intervention I want to focus on for the remainder of my talk. So as the name seasonal malaria chemo prevention or SMC in short suggests, SMC is specifically targeting areas where malaria transmission is seasonal. Now that's the case in areas where there's a, a long dry season with very little or sometimes no rain for much of the year. And during the dry season, there are simply no mosquitoes around, very few mosquitoes because they need stagnant water to, to breed. And if there's no mosquitoes, there's no malaria. So the malaria rates are really low for most of the year. But then the rainy season starts and the mosquitoes start to multiply. People get bitten more often and the malaria cases will just shoot up and they will remain high for the duration of the, uh, the rainy season. And then at the end of the malaria season, the mosquitoes will disappear again after a couple of months and the malaria rates will come down again. And that's really a pattern that we see across much of the Sahel region of West and Central Africa. And usually the rainy season there lasts four or five months, typically between July and October. Now, in its most basic form, SMC involves the regular community-based administration of antimalarials to at-risk populations during the peak malaria season. And the objective is to maintain concentrations of those antimalarials in the bloodstream that's high enough to prevent malaria infections. So that's another important aspect of SMC. It's meant to prevent new infections from developing. It's not meant to, to treat existing infections. And the World Health Organization recommends that SMC should be targeted at children under five years. As I said earlier, they're the most vulnerable to, to malaria. And um, the, the medicines are distributed door by door, door to door. 
um, by, com by volunteer community distributors. And that's really to ensure that as many children as possible are reached by the SMC campaign. Each course of the SMC medicines gives protection for around about 28 days. And then the protection decreases quite rapidly. So that means we need to give those drugs on a monthly basis during the peak malaria season, so during the rainy season. And therefore, each annual round of SMC comprises four or five monthly SMC distribution cycles. And as I said earlier, the rainy season in the Sahel is between July and October. So right now, the 2021 SMC campaign is in, in full swing. And we don't have data yet on the, uh, the target population across all the countries in the Sahel that implement SMC, but we estimate that around about 40 million children across the Sahel will be reached by SMC this year. Now, there's quite a lot of evidence of the effectiveness of SMC. It's well documented in clinical trials. It's been found to prevent up to 75% of all malaria cases and, uh, in, in children under five. And it's also been documented that SMC can be delivered safely at scale. And that SMC is a very cost effective intervention. So one study found that the average cost is about $3.63 per child and year. And I've listed some of the key references here on the right hand side of the slide if you, if you want to read up on the, the available evidence. Now, of course, the, the heart of the SMC intervention is the monthly distribution of the SMC drugs during the rainy season. However, to make that happen, there are lots of other pieces that need to be in place uh, so the campaigns go smoothly. So SMC is, year, it is really a year-round activity. So that starts with the planning phase. So during the planning phase, we estimate the target population. We decide which resources are needed where and, and when. Then those resources need to be procured and they need to be transported uh, to the right place at the right time and the right quantity. We also engage with communities uh, to make sure that the population is well informed about the intervention and that they're supportive. So that includes things like meetings with community leaders, radio spots, etc. And then, as you can probably imagine, uh, there's, there's a huge training component. So hundreds of thousands of SMC implementers are involved in distributing SMC and they all need to be trained before the campaign. And then during the campaign, they're supervised by uh, health workers who are usually based at health facilities. In general, health facilities play an important role in SMC. Uh, so if a child is identified as having malaria at the time of SMC distribution, that child should not get the SMC drugs, but they should get referred to the health facility, they should get tested there, and if the test is positive, they should receive antimalarials as per the national uh, treatment policy. And also while SMC side effects are very rare, they do happen and you need to have a system in place to manage those side effects. So we call that a pharmacovigilance system, which is also coordinated through the, the large network of health facilities that participates in the SMC campaigns. And then finally, we invest in monitoring and evaluating the SMC campaigns. So for example, we conduct regular surveys, household surveys to give us an, an accurate measure of SMC coverage among the, the target population. And one important point is that SMC is implemented through countries' existing health, health uh, systems. And at Malaria Consortium, we see our role as providing technical and logistical support to, to ministries of health across all these various intervention components. To give you a sense of, of, of the scale of our program this year, we are one of the leading implementers of SMC globally at Malaria Consortium and together with our partners in each of these countries, we're aiming to reach just under 20 million children under five in Burkina Faso, in Chad, in Nigeria and in Togo this year. So in other words, we're expecting to support the distribution to around about 50% of all the children in the Sahel that will receive SMC this year. In Nigeria alone, we're targeting over 16 million children in 11 states. And to give you a sense of our funding, so about 60% of the target population that we're reaching this year will be supported by philanthropic donations. 
and uh, the remaining 40% come primarily from the Global Fund to fight uh, AIDS, tuberculosis and malaria. We also have a small grant from the Korean Development Agency that comes about for about 1% of our overall funding. Now, uh, the, the World Health Organization started recommending SMC back in 2012. And that the very rapid scale up of SMC, so from zero in 2012 to 40 million in 2021, is, is very often seen as a, as a success story, one of the few success stories that we've had in, in the malaria world over the last 10 years or so. And philanthropic donations have really played a crucial part in, in making that happen. Uh, we primarily receive those donations because we've been uh, recommended as a top charity by GiveWell, which is an American organization uh, that is very well respected, especially in the effect of altruism communities. I would imagine most of the people on this call today would be familiar with GiveWell. And for Malari Consortium, what this funding does is that it gives us an enormous amount of planning security and of operational uh, flexibility. And I'll just give you one recent example. So a few months ago, we were approached by the National Malaria Program in Nigeria about a funding gap that had emerged just before the start of this year's SMC campaign in one of the states there, Bono, in the northeastern corner there. And that gap meant that at very short notice, about 2 million children were at risk of not being protected through SMC this year. Now, because of, the, of our experience and our relationship with the National Malaria Program, but most importantly, because of the fact that we can make very fast decisions about the use of the philanthropic funding for SMC without too much red tape, we were able to commit at very short notice uh, to support SMC in Borno this year. So right now, SMC is happening across Nigeria, including Borno. And that means that because of this flexibility, we were able to make sure that 2 million children, 2 million additional children were protected with SMC this year. Just a few final words on SMC outside of the Sahel. You may have wondered why uh, I've only been talking about Sahelian countries so far. Surely there's other areas in Africa where malaria transmission is seasonal. Yes, uh, there are. But currently, at least, the World Health Organization's policy recommendation is to focus on West and Central Africa, so focus on the Sahel, because malaria transmission is seasonal there and there is little parasite resistance to the drugs that we're using in SMC. However, we have now reached a stage where most, not all, but most of the eligible children in the Sahel are being reached. And as I mentioned at the beginning of my talk, uh, that there's recognition that we really need to optimize the tools that we already have at our disposal, like SMC. So the World Health Organization and others are now really pushing for SMC to be used more aggressively including in geographies where there's resistance to the, the, the drugs. Now, I'm not going to go into any technical detail here, but there are good technical reasons to believe that SMC as a preventative intervention will still be effective in areas uh, where resistance is high. So with, with that in mind, we have formed a partnership with the malaria programs in Uganda and in um, Mozambique. And we are conducting two research studies there to test the feasibility, the acceptability, and the impact of SMC outside of the Sahel. In both countries, the, uh, the, the protocols, the tools, the materials that were used in the Sahel were adapted to the local context. And both projects are designed as two-year studies, with the first year looking more at feasibility and acceptability, and then followed up in the second year by a much more robust uh, trial of, of impact, of, of effectiveness. Right now, we have results from the first year in Mozambique, uh, where we uh, implemented four cycles of SMC between November last year, February this year, because that's the, the seasonality pattern in that part of the world, reaching about 70,000 children. And uh, we found that it's very feasible, very acceptable. The coverage rates were around about the same as what we would see in, in the Sahel. And the most interesting findings we have to date are from a non-randomized controlled trial where we followed up about 700 children in the two intervention districts and a third district that uh, served as a control. And we found that malaria had a protective effect of about 86%. 
uh, that the next phase of the study will be implemented later this year and we'll be doing a proper randomized control trial as part of that. Um, and we have a very similar project, as I said, in Uganda. Now, I think I need to stress that this is research. And to date, we only have a very limited set of data from the first project stage, so we shouldn't get carried away. There are still a lot of questions that need to be answered about whether or not SMC will work in this part of the world. But um, if, we, if the results are positive, as we, we all hope, and that the signs are good, but we still need to confirm that if the results are good, then that would mean SMC could be used in, in a whole new geography across East and Southern Africa, where, seasonality, where, where malaria transmission is seasonal, so a lot more children could potentially benefit from SMC. Now, I hope this gives you a, a, a good overview of what SMC is and what Malaria Consortium does. I've, uh, I've listed a few reading materials that you might be interested in. Uh, so one is our annual philanthropy report, which provides a lot of information about how we used our philanthropic funding for SMC last year. And then the other is a learning paper where we re reflect on the lessons from implementing SMC during a pandemic. Uh, I haven't really talked about that much, but I, I suppose you can imagine that maintaining mass distribution of, of a preventative malaria intervention during a pandemic requires a lot of adaptations and a lot of efforts. And this paper reflects on what we've learned um, from, from doing that. And all our publications, of course, can be accessed on our website. And then finally, uh, I just wanted to stress that while my role is about SMC, I, I work on SMC 100% of my time. Uh, Malaria Consortium, the organization I work for, has a lot of a lot of other projects and programs in Africa and Asia uh, around our expertise of uh, prevention, control, and treatment of malaria and of other uh, communicable diseases. We have projects in in a range of countries in Africa and Asia. And if you want to find out more about our work, you can always visit us on our website. But for now, I'd like to say thank you very much for your attention and uh, I'm happy to answer any questions you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much, Christian. Uh, okay, so uh, we have a few questions. Uh, I think we can start from... Um, because <laughs> few of them was already answered uh, and I'm picking. Uh, okay. Uh, has uh, COVID-19 affected SMC delivery? How COVID-19 impacted projects across your organization? What challenges Malaria Consortium was is facing? Sure, thanks. thanks for that. I mean, as I hinted towards the end of my presentation, COVID has had a massive impact on our programs. Um, and including SMC. I'm, I'm very proud to say that uh, SMC campaigns have not been interrupted. They weren't last year and they haven't been interrupted this year by SMC, but uh, by, by COVID-19. But making that happen uh, required immense efforts of, of everyone involved. So you have to imagine when, when WHO declared the COVID-19 outbreak a pandemic uh, in around about March last year, preparations for the 2020 campaign were already well underway. Uh, so we, we were really sort of, uh, we really didn't have much time to respond. But Malaria Consortium, in line with uh, World Health Organization recommendations, took the position very early on that um, SMC is an essential health service and that discontinuing SMC because of COVID would risk a substantial increase in malaria cases and deaths among children under five, which would put additional pressure on health systems that would already be uh, an, an, under immense strain because of COVID-19. So we, we decided very early on that we should do whatever, whatever we can together with our partners to make sure that SMC would continue. So we got together with WHO and others, we developed some operational guidance around the, the safe delivery of, of SMC, so factoring, factoring in infection prevention and control measures like hand washing, wearing a face mask, keeping a, a, a physical distance between the implementers and uh, the, the, uh, the, the beneficiaries. 
And then we develop tools to help implementers uh, adhere to those guidelines. So things like uh, job aids for the community distributors that really uh, illustrate how to keep a physical distance while you're administering a drug to a, a community member. Uh, other, other things that, that we did were moving a lot of the meetings from in-person meetings online, including some of the trainings that were delivered uh, virtually. Now, I should mention that all of that, of course, came at a cost. Uh, we had to invest quite substantially into uh, COVID-19 related commodities like face masks, like hand sanitizer. So to make a campaign of that scale, possible uh, that there was a, a huge procurement effort involved in making sure that enough masks for example were available and enough hand sanitizer was available for all the implementers as i said we were able to uh, to keep the smc campaigns going we're not aware of any major contributions to uh, covid 19 outbreaks through the smc campaign so we think we've we've managed to keep everyone uh, everyone involved reasonably safe and of course, we learned from what we did last year. We applied the lessons this year. We changed, we changed our guidance slightly to make it, uh, make it easier for people to adhere to the guidelines. But the general principle remains the same. So there are a lot of risk mitigation pleasure, um, measures still in place to make sure that uh, both the implementers but also the communities are as safe as pos possible. And so that was using SMC as an example of all our work. Um, but it, I think it illustrates the the, uh, the challenges that Malaria Consortium faced across all our programs and all our projects. So there was an immense effort that went into defining appropriate infection prevention and control measures to make sure that the, the projects uh, were able to keep going. Thank you. Uh, now uh, I'll take one question from the chat. Uh, considering Oh, sorry. Uh, considering the seasonal changes, how many does uh, a year of this medicine one child needs to get in a year to be fully protected? Uh, could we have links from last slide posted in the chat, please? Uh... Sure. So um, I'm I'm very happy to share those slides with with you and for you to share the slides with the the participants. So you will have the the links. Um, is the question, what's the impact of changing seasonality patterns? And is there a chance that SMC may be, may be used for more than the four months, the typical four months that I was talking about? Is that the, the question? Uh, Martina, um, maybe. Hi, yes, sorry, maybe I will unmute myself and it's going to be better. So basically, I was wondering about how many doses a, a year a child needs to get to be fully protected, which basically, um, I just want to know, like, calculate the cost of sure. it per year. Sure, yeah, got it. So um, the, the standard model is what I described in the presentation. The standard model is four monthly uh, full courses of the two anti-malaria medicines that we're using in SMC. Now, some countries have started looking at their seasonality patterns, and there are areas where the malaria season is slightly longer, so say five months instead of four months, and they've now gone to implementing five cycles of SMC in those areas. At the moment, a rough split is 85% of all the children who are receiving SMC are getting four cycles, maybe about 15% are receiving five cycles. And um, I, I think that's probably going to increase slightly in the future. So maybe it will go to one, one quarter receiving five cycles and the remaining three quarters receiving the traditional four cycles. Uh, the, the cost of adding an, an additional cycle is actually not that high. However, of course, there's a, there's a cutoff at some point. There's a cutoff both from the cost side, but also from the effectiveness and the safety side. So if you start giving it too often, there are safety concerns. Uh, so you couldn't give it every month of the year for, for, you know, for, 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 for forever, basically. So there'll be safety concerns, but also it would no longer be cost effective. So the current modeling shows that five cycles is still cost effective. Uh, but probably even going to six cycles in areas where the, the transmission is even longer would no longer be cost effective. Uh, the the three dollars sixty per year in cycle that was a figure for four cycles. Actually, it was from a couple of years ago. We're probably sitting 
around about four dollars per per year and uh, and and child at the moment. So adding another cycle will maybe add another an, a, another fifty cents to to the. May I ask two additional questions? I wanted to ask uh, how the pandemics actually influenced the prices because we know everything went up. So you basically um, sort of uh, answered that. Uh, but also I wanted to ask if the dose uh, for adults is the same as for childs or is it higher? Yeah, no, we're only giving it to children under five. So the intervention is focusing on children under five. There are discussions about expanding it to children under 10. Um, no one's doing that at the moment. Personally, I have my doubts about that. So for now, SNC is only delivered to children under five. There are two dosing regimens for different age groups within that. So there's a lower dose for children up to one year, and then there's a slightly higher dose for children between one and, and five years. And there's a small cost difference between between those two. Um, sorry, I forgot the the first. Oh, the first part of your question was about um, was about COVID nineteen and prices. Mm -hmm. uh, so in general, the so the the cost for the drugs hasn't changed because of the pandemic. The general cost of implementing, in the sense of paying the distributors, etc., that hasn't changed. What has changed is the addition of the infection prevention and control measures. So previously, we didn't have to procure face masks for SMC. Previously, we didn't have to procure hand sanitizer for, for SMC. Uh, so that, that has increased the cost quite a bit. I don't have any accurate unit costs that I could share. It would also be, well, you know, for last year, we only have this one year of, of uh, cost data. I would expect the cost to come down a little because I think we all have to content with the fact that S that uh, COVID will be around for, for some time and we'll have to deal with COVID for, for some time to come. Um, but yeah, so that was the main cost impact. I should probably also mention that in some respects, COVID made the intervention cheaper because uh, we could travel less. Right? So I, I haven't been to any of the SMC countries in the last two years. Now, obviously, that's only a small, tiny portion of the overall cost. But you know, it's it's something uh, some of the trainings went online so rather than paying for people to come to a training venue pay for the venue pay per diems etc you just pay for a zoom license so that's sort of reduced the cost overall the increase was much higher than the the cost savings though but as i said i can't give you any reliable uh, re reliable costing data i don't think that would be uh, um yeah I can't, it wouldn't be reliable it wouldn't tell you much thank you in in our in the philanthropy report, there's a link in the in the slides. We do talk about so the overall cost of SMC, and we do provide an overall amount for what we think we've invested in in things like face masks, etc. So that'll give you an idea, but don't don't read too much into it. As I say, it's, it's data from one year, and it was the most unusual year we've all all experienced. So I wouldn't read too much into it. Thanks. Uh, Martina, uh, you have some more questions, or it was the last? Uh, not for now, thank you. Okay, thanks. Uh, so, uh, I think uh, next interesting question uh, is, uh, could SMC uh, be replaced by a malaria vaccine one day, uh, as there is now a vaccine with uh, 70 plus uh, percent efficiency available. Uh, is Malaria Consortium looking into broadening efforts into vaccination campaigns as well? And uh, it is also a similar question. Uh, wh when it comes to the future of fighting uh, malaria, what are the developments you are looking forward uh, to the most? Uh, vaccines, uh, gen drives, uh, more access to medical services, uh, and which areas of basic research into malaria are the most neglected in your opinion? Um, let me start by addressing the question of the vaccines and how that might affect SMC in the in the longer term. Um, it's it's a very difficult question to answer with with any degree of confidence at this stage. But I'll I'll tell you what my thoughts are at, at this point in time. So as as you say, there are various vaccines in the pipeline. Uh, one's been around for quite some time now. It's called the RTSS vaccine, and the efficacy efficacy results have been Bit of a mixed bag to be perfectly honest and it hasn't currently it hasn't been recommended for scale up by the world health organization yet the 
other vaccine that I think you're probably referring to uh, with the 75% uh, statement that's made the, the news recently um, because researchers just published results from a trial that was conducted in Burkina Faso, I believe. Uh, the vaccine doesn't have a, an established name yet. I've heard it referred to as the Oxford vaccine for, for malaria. Um, now, the study looked very robust and the results looked very promising. Um, that's, that's good news. That's very good news. However, so far that's based on just this one study with a fairly small sample of children. So I think there's quite a lot of research that still needs to be done before we can speculate about the potential role of this vaccine in the fight against malaria. Now, of course, if COVID has taught us anything and that um, research on vaccines can be uh, can, can be fast-tracked. So maybe it's going to happen faster than I currently think, but I would say it's probably a few years down the line. Now, I also know that there's other researchers who've been doing some research in Burkina Faso and Mali looking at combining the RTSS vaccine and SMC. Uh, they've, they've published a protocol for that trial. They haven't published the results yet, so I can't say much about it. We're told the publication of the results is imminent, but I haven't seen them. And we've also been told that the results are promising, but again, I haven't seen them. I think the point here is that in the medium term, a scenario I think is realistic is a combination of a vaccine and SMC as a potential strategy in the future. So it's not necessarily an either or, but rather a bit of both. So I think that's the most likely sort of longer term strategy, but again, that's that's sort of looking into a crystal ball. So I, th I think it's a bit too early to, to say that with any degree of, of confidence. Um, then the the broader question was, well, what are what are other other innovations that, that we're looking forward to? Um, so the, the vaccines to me would be number one. Uh, I think there's also innovation needed in terms of new and effective anti-malarials for treating malaria infections, and probably as important, even though it gets, it gets uh, forgotten about uh, quite easily, is the diagnostic tools. So easy to use, reliable tools to, to diagnose malaria at the community level, that that would really transform the way we, we, uh, we, we treat malaria. Um, a bit more out there in the sort of R&D space is uh, what's called monoclonal antibodies. Uh, I'm certainly not an expert on that. Uh, I've, I've, I can't really say much about it, but that is another another buzzword that you will hear when you when you um, have, when you're listening in on discussions about the future of of malaria. All of these, though, are a couple of years down the line. So I think, as I said in my talk, in the medium and the short term, I think what we really need to focus on. Um, is using the tools we already have. We have good tools already at our disposal. We need to get better at using them, using them smartly and, and, uh, and making sure that people actually have access to those tools. Interesting, thank you so much. Uh, and I think maybe it will be last question, but maybe, maybe two, we'll see. Uh, um, mm -hmm. Uh, sorry. Okay. Uh, what has been your experience of working with GiveWell and, and the effective altruism community? Uh, yeah, <laughs> that's a that's a very good and very interesting question. Um, I I hope I managed to get across in my talk that I can't overemphasize the role philanthropic funding has played in scaling up SMC across the Sahel. So back in 20, 2015, 2016, 17, there was an initial scale up project which was funded by, by UNITAID. It was led by Malaria Consortium and it established SMC in seven countries, reaching about 7 million children at the time. So that project generated some of the evidence that SMC can be delivered at scale and effectively. But it typically takes a while for the the large institutional donors to pick up on that evidence, to uh, to to uh, think, build it into their models, and build it into their future funding streams. So fortunately, around this time when this project ended in 2017, philanthropic funding for SMC became available through through GiveWell, which has uh, 
allowed Monero Consortium to maintain and to even grow the scale of, of SMC, as I, as I showed in my, in my talks. We're now reaching about 20 million children, just Monero Consortium. And even now, when some of the traditional funders, and in particular the Global Fund, have bought into SMC and they've substantially increased their, their funding for SMC, I think there is still a, an important complementary role for, for philanthropy. And as I said during my presentation, for us, for Malaria Consortium, it's the planning security and the operational flexibility that's, that's transformational for the way in which we work. I, I gave you the example earlier of being able to support Borno State in Nigeria this year, making sure that 2 million additional children are, are, are protected from malaria. It wouldn't have been possible to do that in a, in a traditional institutional funding arrangement. So having this this philanthropic funding available is absolutely transformational for us. And there are a lot of other examples I could cite. And we're really immensely grateful to all our supporters from GiveWell and the effective altruism community. Now, when we think about the challenges, I would say it's taken us as public health practitioners some, it, it, it took us some getting used to the, so the approach and the thinking behind uh, well, give well's work and the effective altruism approach. So you obviously have a very clear focus on cost effectiveness, whereas public health NGOs like Malaria Consortium, we tend to look at things more from a health system strengthening point of view. So sometimes when we're having discussions with give well, there's almost like a, a clash of, of philosophies, if you like, a philosophical clash between uh, their thinking and our thinking. However, we have a very, very constructive working relationship with GiveWell, with other effective altruists, with other effective altruism um, uh, organizations in, in other countries. And whenever, they, they tend to ask a lot of questions, but whenever they do that, I can, I can genuinely say that they're always helpful and that they prompt us to think things through from a slightly different angle, which I find uh, a very enriching experience. Thank you, Christian. Uh, it was amazing to hear in this uh, information from you. And uh, unfortunately, we have to um, go and go to this to the end now. Um, and uh, on behalf of EA Poland, uh, I'm really grateful uh, to Christian and the Malaria Consortium uh, team, especially Ashley Giles, uh, who, he's, uh, who uh, is here with us now, uh, who worked with me on the uh, organization of this event. Uh, thank you for giving your time. Uh, I hope that the uh, SMC program and Malaria Consortium work uh, is now more clear and understandable for you. Uh, and uh, what I can say, I, I encourage you to follow uh, the activities of MC and uh, EA Poland uh, and remember of our fundraiser, uh, which ends uh, the end of September. Thanks. Thanks very much for giving us the opportunity. Um, thanks for your support and best of luck to uh, the effective altruism movement in Poland. So um, I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing more from, from you and your, your colleagues. Thank you so much. Have a good day, everyone. Thank you for coming. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye.